Now we're ready to look at local control of tissue perfusion. Now tissue perfusion refers to blood flow through particular tissues and so we'll want to regulate that blood flow and that would be a auto regulation or how those tissues themselves regulate blood flow for local kinds of control. So we'll look at these different types of autoregulation mechanisms and then look at some changes more long term in response to changes in uh, tissue needs. And that would be the angiogenesis and collateral circulation. So first let's think about tissue perfusion. Tissue perfusion is blood flow through body tissues, so it's going to be thinking in terms of delivery of oxygen and nutrients and removal of waste to particular tissues, to gas exchange in the lungs, to nutrient absorption in the digestive tract, or urine formation. Basically everywhere uh, blood is needed and nutrient or waste exchange takes place, we need to regulate that blood flow depending on the tissue's needs. We also want to make sure that we get good exchange of nutrients across the capillary walls so we have a relationship or an inverse relationship between blood flow or velocity of blood flow and cross-sectional area. And that's what this picture here is showing. Imagine I can take a cadaver and take every single one of the blood vessels and measure its cross-sectional area and then add that up for each blood vessel type. So in other words, if I took all of the arteries and measured their cross-sectional area and added them all up, and took every single arteriole and measured those, and then I took every single capillary and measured the cross-sectional area of the capillaries and added those up, and I did that for venules, veins, and the vena cava, I would get this relationship. That is, the capillaries, notice, have the highest total cross-sectional area. Okay, whereas arterioles and arteries have less and venules and veins have less. Now what that means then is that blood flow velocity decreases as cross-sectional area increases. And to think of an analogy of that, think of a river um, dumping its water into a lake. If I looked at the river, I could see the current. I can see the velocity of the water in that river very easily. It's very high velocity. But if I look to the lake where the cross-sectional area is much larger, I don't see the current. I can't see the water moving because the, the velocity of the water has declined drastically because of the lake's larger cross-sectional area. So we basically have the same scenario here. Because the cross-sectional area of the capillaries is so big, the velocity of blood flow is very low, which is a good thing because that allows for nutrients to be exchanged. So we can put oxygen and all the nutrients into the tissues and I can pick up CO2 and waste products from the tissues because I got time because the blood is flowing slowly through those capillaries. And then it picks up speed after it leaves that, which is good because remember, arteries and veins jobs are just to get the blood from, from the heart to the capillaries or from the capillaries back to the heart. So they're not doing anything other than transporting the blood. Right at the capillaries is where we needed to go slow so we could have lots of time for nutrient waste exchange going on. I also want to regulate how blood is flowing through those capillaries, in particular tissues, depending on the needs of that tissue. That's referred to as autoregulation, the idea of local factors that change blood flow in the capillary beds. And this may be in response to chemical changes or even to um, stretch in the smooth muscles of the blood vessels feeding into those capillary beds. This is all intrinsic control mechanisms, that is local control um, that triggers changes in blood flow to those tissues. One type of mechanism that would be in play here are as metabolic or chemical responses by the smooth muscles uh, to particular metabolites or even oxygen levels. So for example, let's say you're exercising and we're looking at the skeletal muscle 
um, that's actively involved in the exercise. So that means the muscle has a higher metabolic activity going on. That means it has low oxygen and high metabolized waste products. Think of CO2, um, lactic acid buildup in that. In response to those low levels of oxygen or high CO2 metabolite uh, levels, the tissue releases a vasodilator called nitric oxide. In response to that nitric oxide then, the arterioles and the precapillary sphincters are going to dilate. They get bigger in diameter, therefore more blood flow can go into that organ, into that muscle, and provide you with more oxygen and nutrients so you can exercise or use that skeletal muscle more effectively. This is such an important local control that can actually override the sympathetic nervous system's desire, so to speak, for vasoconstriction. So even though the sympathetic nervous system wants to vasoconstrict blood vessels, say to the digestive tract, if it attempts to vasoconstrict to your skeletal muscles, the high demand for oxygen, which means resulting in low levels of oxygen, is actually going to override that sympathetic input and cause still those blood vessels to dilate. Nitric oxide release can also be influenced by other chemicals besides those metabolites or low oxygen levels and things like um, endothelial cells uh, being stimulated by acetylcholine, histamine, or even shear stress can cause nitric oxide formation. And here in this example, we see acetylcholine binding, triggering um, a cascade of events inside the endothelial cell. Remember, that's the inside lining here. But the important part of this is that nitric oxide is formed. Nitric oxide then will cause a second messenger system to be activated in the smooth muscle. That second messenger system results in cyclic GMP, which activates protein kinases, and those protein kinases are then responsible for muscle relaxation. So the more nitric oxide, the more cyclic GMP, the more the muscle relaxes is the idea. But we need to limit the levels of cyclic GMP, and that's the job of phosphodiesterase. Again, phosphodiesterase will block cyclic GMP, and therefore that lowers protein kinase levels and lowers the amount of muscle relaxation. So we can take advantage of this in the pharmaceutical industry and use what are called phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Now phosphodiesterase inhibitors will do just exactly what their names say. They're going to block phosphodiesterase. If I don't have phosphodiesterase, I then don't have blockage of cyclic GMP, which means instead of lower protein kinase levels, I have higher levels. And if I have higher levels, it means I have more muscle relaxation. That is the diameter of those blood vessels gets larger. I get improved blood flow to those tissues. Now where this has been applied is in drugs such as erectile dysfunction related drugs. So that, that way there's no blockage of the um, dilation of the blood vessels in the penis. The parasympathetic nervous system is in charge of causing uh, the penis to become erect by increasing blood flow to it. And so that way, by blocking phosphodiesterase, I then enhance the amount of dilation within the penis. Now, another way we can have autoregulation is through myogenic mechanisms. These myogenic mechanisms are important in maintaining a constant blood flow to tissues in response to small changes in blood pressure. The way it works is that vascular smooth muscle will contract when it's stretched and it relaxes when there's a reduction in stress or stretch. So for example, let's say we have a decrease in pressure. So since the have a decrease in pressure, there's not as much arterial pressure in that organ. That means a decrease in blood flow. 
That means less stretch on the blood vessel wall. Therefore, the arterioles in response to decreased stretch relax or dilate, and that's gonna restore blood flow to the organ. So small changes in blood pressure then can result, which would actually small changes in blood pressure if there was no myogenic mechanism in play would mean a reduction in blood flow. But so if, with a reduction in blood pressure, if I dilate that blood vessel, I'm going to be able to restore blood flow to those tissues. I can also go the opposite direction. That is if I go from say laying down to standing up and all that blood goes and pulls in my legs, that's going to stretch the, um, blood vessel wall, and that's going to cause vasoconstriction so that I don't have those blood vessels swelling up. And if that didn't work, I would end up with edema, and that, of course, not what we want to have happening. Now, the idea of these autoregulation mechanisms, whether it's the metabolite levels or myogenic responses, is to help maintain blood flow. So, for example, in this diagram here, let's imagine at point this time zero, uh, blood pressure drops for some reason. That, if no autoregulation is in play, would result in a huge drop in blood flow to those tissues. Okay, That wouldn't be any good. So our autoregulation mechanisms will kick in, causing um, local blood diameter or blood vessel diameters to increase and therefore help restore uh, blood flow to those tissues. Now there are also some long-term changes in um, tissue vascularity in response to metabolic needs. And that is what's referred to as angiogenesis. That is an increase in blood vessel numbers or density um, in response to metabolism. So, for example, in this uh, muscle tissue from a rat, um, we can generate more blood vessels if it is stimulated for over extended period of time. Um, you can see the number of capillaries has increased quite extensively because, again, there's a high metabolic need here. So we'll form new blood vessels or angiogenesis and therefore be able to provide those tissues with the oxygen they need. Now, this can happen faster for younger tissues than for older tissues, uh, but it does happen uh, quite easily. But it also takes a longer period of time. Now, several factors also promote angiogenesis. These are going to be things like vascular endothelial growth factors that are released by the tissues or fibroblast growth factors and even angiogenin all released by the tissues uh, to help promote angiogenesis. Now, with this angiogenesis, a formation of new blood vessels, then we can get what's called collateral circulations. And this picture shows us one example of this. This is actually the blood vessels of a heart. You can see here where they put in a, a stent. Um, and so this is basically a um, sonogram of the, of the blood vessels in the heart. And there's the stent there. And so the blockage of blood flow is over here. There should be an artery or blood flowing through that artery, but it's completely blocked. Now, when a blockage occurs or when there's decreased blood flow through one of the coronary arteries, if that blockage is builds up slowly, not a fast, quick, like a thrombosis, but maybe a plaque that builds up over years and years and years, it gives your heart a chance to build a new blood vessel, and that's what's shown down here. It's built, you have a collateral circulation to provide the tissues down here with the needed blood supply. Now here, though, is after the angioplasty, after it was placed in, they restored the circulation, and so now you can see here uh, blood flow has been restored. But here still is the idea we're showing this idea of a collateral circulation, a new blood vessel that um, grew in response to a blockage up here. So that's going to end our look at um, autoregulation. The next thing we want to do is look at how we're going to prevent edema or the effects that we see with edema 
and um, fluid exchanges across the capillary uh, walls in what's called capillary fluid dynamics.